neighbors take Halloween a little too seriously. By color blindness. Let me start out by saying that I'm not a people person. When the pandemic hit North America, it was probably the best damn thing that happened to me. Most of my time is spent online anyway, seeing as I work in a data collection unit for an auditing company. Let me tell you, that wasn't much fun either, given how crazy 2020 has been. Anyway, none of that has to do with the problem that I've been having, but I figured that most people start these rants off with a few anecdotal notes, so there you go. In a nutshell, I like to be left alone. That is why, when I walked out into early September and saw that my neighbors were already beginning to decorate their house with spooky stuff, like inflatable Frankensteins and ghosts, I was a bit put off. Now, I will admit that they do this almost every year. They have four boys all in elementary school, and of course they always want the holidays to be big so why should 2020 be any different pandemic included? It's just that their house sits adjacent to mine, so when I walk out, it's the first thing I see every day. And now, thanks to these over-the-top decorations, I was going to be seeing even more of it. Gradually every day they added to the house. A few hanging plastic bats here, some spider webs there, I was doing my best to ignore it, really. And I know how I'm going to sound here, being the Grinch of Halloween to some. So naturally I kept it to myself. But that ended a few nights back when I started to hear the wails. They installed large speakers near the attic, I think because the screams coming from the attic were intense. It sounded like they literally had managed to get a sound bite from a crime scene. Let me tell you, hearing that kind of noise at 3.30 in the morning is a bit alarming. I instinctively dialed 911 and complained. I wasn't going to stay up all night simply because they wanted to turn their place into a haunted house. Unfortunately for me, the police said that if it wasn't a serious problem where the other neighbors complained, then it wasn't a serious violation of any noise ordinances in the neighborhood. You can't be serious. Just listen to this. How am I supposed to get any sleep? I shouted, holding the phone so they could hear. Maybe that was a bit much, but I was pissed, and I had every right to be, I think. What the hell did we have noise ordinances in this neighborhood for, if not to enforce them? The operator reminded me that the line was meant for emergencies only. <laughs> emergencies. And bid me a good night, leaving me frustrated and sleep-deprived. I went down to my kitchen, got a bottle of Jack, and drank enough to knock myself out on the couch, trying to time the obnoxious screams. The next day I had cooled down a little bit, and went over to talk to my neighbors after breakfast. Crossing their front lawn was like going through a minefield, though, thanks to the pop-up ghosts and graves that they had placed in the yard, buried and then covered with sod to conceal them. The first few nearly gave me a heart attack as I moved to the door, wrapping my knuckles on it to get their attention. No one came. I tried again, but got no response, so I walked around to the garage and tried there. It was open and I couldn't help but notice that their car was gone and that there was a large pool of fake blood on the concrete floor. God, the lengths these people went to to celebrate. I stepped forward and noted that they had a few other decorations lying around too, like severed heads and zombie body parts, which I assumed would be placed in the front yard later. The whole thing smelled to high heaven though, I held my nose for a bit and went to the door near the laundry room, trying again to get someone's attention, but again no one came. 
I sighed deeply and walked across the fake blood and paused to see where the bizarre smell was coming from. There were trash bags lying near the garage door, soaking wet from some recent rainstorm, and I rolled my eyes, realizing it had to be that. Despite the fact that I wasn't feeling very neighborly, I went ahead and took the trash to the street, and then went back to my house, wondering if any of my other neighbors would care enough to lodge a complaint. Other than this Halloween nut, the other folks around here are pretty ordinary, but none of them live close enough to really hear the noise like I do. I decided instead that night to try and record it, so that that way I could let the authorities listen and prove I was dealing with a real nuisance on my block, not just some fabrication figment of my Halloween-crazed imagination. Back home, I took a shower and got some equipment from downstairs ready to listen. But surprisingly, there was no screams that night. Just silence. I stayed up to the wee hours of the morning. I sound so old saying that, but it's true. I was thinking maybe they realized I had called and complained about them, so that was why they were quiet. So I called it a night and decided to try it again next day. It was more of the same, though. Not a peep. In fact, I was starting to notice that not one of my neighbors was coming out of their house. This guy had four kids. It's hard not to notice them in the early morning as they scramble to catch the bus especially because the driver of the bus is so courteous that he blasts his horn to get the mom's attention for the littlest ones to grab a face mask. But now, there was nothing happening. It was that way for nearly a week, too, and I started to grow worried. I hated their Halloween decorations granted, but this was becoming strange. At first, I told myself it was because I hadn't gotten much sleep, but then I started doubting myself. What if the scream hadn't been some kind of faux imitation? It rolled around in my mind like a pair of old dice, trying to figure out what I heard. What if the wife had been attacked? What if it was a break-in? Then I thought back to the fake blood, and my body got stiff, thinking how I stepped through it. <sighs> Had I mistakenly walked into a real crime scene? The arms, the severed heads, my paranoia was screaming to me. My God, how could I have been so blind? I grabbed my robe and rushed out into the dead of night to go see, using my smartphone's light as a guide across the murky suburb streets. Their house was so quiet now, not even a light on. I started to doubt myself again. Had it always been this quiet? I saw the plastic bats and pop-up graves, and they seemed like they had been there a lot longer than I remembered. Checking the garage got me nowhere. Now instead of seeing blood, it was spotless, as though someone had come in and cleaned the entire scene. It made me internally shiver as a dramatic scene played out in my mind. Chris, that was the husband's name. Chris was working in the kitchen, trying to get dinner ready because his wife Janice wasn't feeling good. <laughs> it was a plot that had been brewing in my mind for months, I told myself. He was gradually lacing their food, yes, to weaken her, and tonight, he planned to finish the job. The screams I had heard, well, they must have been when she realized something was off. Maybe Chris had decided he couldn't wait for her to just die. He wanted it to be swift. Had I seen him with a pretty young woman around town? <laughs> Maybe. Yes, I think I had. In that coffee shop near the town square... Was he having an affair? If I was his age and knew his wife couldn't perform in the bedroom, I wouldn't have blamed him. But murder wasn't an answer. 
All of these thoughts scrambled to my brain as I stood there in the garage, taking in what had happened. I needed to get inside and check on his wife. What if he had left evidence? I ran back to my house, my heart racing now as I grabbed a few tools from my shed. I noticed, though, that some of them were missing, but I found what I needed. A crowbar could open my way into their house. I smashed it open in two tries and stepped into a dusty, dreary laundry room. Trying to turn on the lights had gotten me nowhere. Instead, it was obvious that the family wasn't paying their bills. The house was cold like a tomb. My footsteps echoed down the empty corridor as I called out to anyone inside, but it looked like the place was abandoned. I took a step forward, when abruptly a fake axe smashed its way out of the wall and I jumped back. (laughs) It, it, It was just another Halloween prop, but it looked so real, so lifelike. Chris must have just finished placing up more Halloween decorations when he decided to go up the stairs and take care of his wife. The boys had been in the den playing video games when they heard the screams. I imagined them running up to check on their mom, and then their dad panicked. He must have thought that the games would be loud enough that they wouldn't hear, or maybe He had hoped that Janice wouldn't put up a fight at all. He had miscalculated, and before he knew it, now he had a massacre on his hands. I walked up the steps, thinking how likely he had hunted his own children in this house. They must have been so frightened. I could see different places in the wall where they had stopped to catch their breath, or skirts in the rug where they had tried to hide but their father was consumed with killing now. He was on a mission. Their begging and pleading wouldn't stop him. The little one probably went first, I thought, as I got to the top of the stairs. The severed heads I had seen in the garage haunted me again as I thought of how he had murdered them. It was beyond repulsive. Upstairs, I saw what looked like a hanging corpse It was upside down from the rafters, with its head loose as well, and it looked like it was meant to deter visitors from entering the master suite. I ignored the prop and pushed through, desperate to see if I was right about what had transpired, but the room looked empty as well. Other than more Halloween decorations, it was another immaculate example of how Chris had gone so far to cover his tracks. What had he done with the rest of the body parts, though? I thought about the trash I had taken out and felt sick. He he must have cut up all their bodies and planned to toss them out as well. I stood in a daze, realizing how far he had been willing to go. The poor children turned into shredded cheese just because of his lust for another woman. I couldn't help but vomit and shudder as I ran to the bathroom. As I heaved and caught my breath over the toilet, I checked in there for more clues. He had to have used chemicals on Janice's body in the tub, like like that Edgar Allan Poe story, what was it called, The, The Telltale Heart, where that sick bastard had dismembered the body in the tub. I smelled the essence of weird bleach. Dissolving her with acids, that would have been easy. But how had he gotten access to anything like that? Then I thought about my own shed. (sighs) Had he broken in and taken my tools, the, the ones that were missing? Was he trying to frame me for this? I'm not sure why my brain jumped to that, but it instantly made me paranoid and I swallowed hard. What did I do? I had already contacted the police. Should I file another report? But they hadn't listened to me the first time, so now it made me feel like I was going to be a troublemaker. What if I was wrong about all of this, too? 
I needed more proof, I decided. I moved back into the hallway where the corpse was dangling from the ceiling and got a better look at it. My stomach dropped as it occurred to me this was no prop. It was Chris. I scrambled to find a way to cut him down, hoping to God he was still alive. It seemed unlikely, though. There was no way that anyone could be after a few minutes, let alone days. But still, I did my best to cut him down and tried to resuscitate him. His skin was blue and his body was rigid. I felt sick, realizing that he had killed himself after finishing his family off. It was the only answer that made sense. Some part of me felt it was deserved, though, if my guess of how events played out was right. There was no way anyone with a conscience could live with themselves after killing their children, I thought. I took my smartphone out and got a few pictures, the proof I would need to show the police. Then I made my way out of there. It felt like the house was really haunted now now that I knew of the reality of what had happened there, and I didn't want to spend another hour in it, not even one minute. Back home, I tried to put the final pieces of the puzzle together in my brain. The only part that didn't make sense was Chris's lover. Surely she would have come looking for them, <laughs> or at least him. Where was she? I got some shut-eye and tried not to be mortified by the thought that maybe Chris had gone after her, too. The next day I was rudely woken up by the sound of the police at my door. I didn't remember calling them, but I let them in anyway. What they told me has made me feel sick. They were there with a warrant to search my premises. One of my neighbors had reported suspicious activity in the area. The sounds of screaming. I nearly lost it, angered that they were taking these reports seriously instead of my own. But inwardly my stomach was twisting and turning. What if Chris had somehow planted evidence against me before he committed suicide? The officers combed my house and brought canine units in to sniff every nook and cranny. It didn't take long for them to find the trash bags, the ones I was sure that I had taken to the road, the ones filled with body parts. The shed was next. They found trace evidence that my fingerprints were all over the tools that were used to kill the family. I started to vomit trying to find words that made sense. <laughs> of course my fingerprints would be there. They were my tools, for God's sake. I hardly knew what else to show them, so I insisted to the officers they needed to check out Chris's house. That was where the true crime had been committed, after all. They questioned me for what felt like hours. I was literally sure I was going to the slammer for this perceived crime. It felt like my life was over. I was frightened, shaking like a leaf as I told them what I believed happened. This is just a misunderstanding. I pay my taxes. I donate to the city. These people are the ones that are sick. I stammered. I told them how this had started and with the family obsession for, for Halloween. My mind started to play tricks on me again as I replayed the events. What if it had all been a massive stunt? What if none of it were real? I was losing my mind. The world was spinning. Were these even real cops? If so, they were going to toss me in a cell and throw away the key. But... If not, I panicked as they kept writing their report and told them I, I, I needed to use the restroom. I went there to vomit and to think. There wasn't going to be any way out of this if it was for real. All the evidence pointed toward me. My palms were sweaty and I started to convulse. There. There had to be a way out. 
I slammed my fist against the glass, causing shards to break in my hand. My fist was bloody now, but my hand was no longer shaking. In that moment, a new version of events played out in my head. <laughs> One where I was the culprit. Mm. I'm not a people person. I hate my neighbors. Their decorations keep me up at all hours of the night. Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving. This year, I had hoped that the pandemic would stop them, but it seemed to spur them on, actually, even further. Had I gone over there to confront them, gotten into a heated argument and killed them all? <sighs> no, it, it couldn't be. I, I didn't remember doing that. <laughs> My reflection showed a twisted and dark smile, and it sent shivers down my spine. What was happening to me? I slammed at the glass again, trying to make it break entirely. The police managed to break the bathroom door down and pulled me away. The rest of the evening, uh, it was a bit of a blur. They gave me something to calm my nerves and to get me start talking about the event, the reality of what had really happened over the past few days. My neighbors had been dead for a year now, they said, and another neighbor down the street had grown concerned for my well-being when it seemed that I had checked on them more frequently than I was wont as though I thought they were still alive. They had no evidence to hold me because the trash bags that had the body parts in them didn't seem to hold any fingerprints, so it could have just as easily been someone else that had dropped them there. They had been sitting in my shed, sliced up and mutilated for a year now. They said the crime was still an ongoing investigation, and since they didn't have a warrant, they just had to bid me a good night, having finished their wellness check. And I started out toward the neighbor's house. It was abandoned, a crime scene from a year ago on Halloween, when I had grown tired of their screams and antics. And as I stared at their decorations, I saw their ghosts standing in the front lawn, glaring at me pointing at me for their deaths. <laughs> I now know how this Halloween will play out, because even if I didn't anticipate this nightmare, now I've become part of their celebration. of terror. The car finally gave out. Jeff hit the dashboard in frustration. It was bad enough that the car had to break down, but at night, in the rain, in the middle of God knows wherever he was, it was a fitting end to a bad week. This week had seen his wife leave him, taking the kids with her to boot. He had been demoted at his job and now was forced to go back on the road as a salesman. Now this thing had happened, and things weren't going to get any better any time soon. Jeff decided that he might as well try to find a way out of this mess. He considered waiting in the car for another car to come by and help him. The road wasn't often used, though, and that might take hours, so Jeff decided to get out and walk down the road to see if there were any other options. 
After walking for half an hour in the pounding rain, Jeff finally came across an old house in the woods. Now, Jeff had seen the horror movies to make him turn back, but the rain alone was enough to override his sense of fear and trepidation. He walked up the winding road to the door. The house looked to be very old and not kept up well at all, and Jeff wondered if anyone lived there anymore. He knocked on the door, and to his surprise, it was answered rather quickly. An old man, looking to be in his late seventies, asked him what he wanted. Jeff explained his situation and asked if the man had a phone or some way to help. The old man said he was wary of travelers, but decided that Jeff looked honest enough and let him use his phone. Jeff thanked him and asked his name. His name was Joseph Palmer and told Jeff the number of the nearest garage. Jeff made his way to the phone, noticing that the house looked about as old inside as it did outside, and was surprised that there was even a phone in the place. He called the garage, and they told him that there was nothing they could do until morning. They would just have to meet him at noon at his car. Mr. Palmer offered the guest room for him to sleep the night. Jeff was a bit wary at spending the night in such a spooky old place but decided that the walk back in the rain and sleeping in the car couldn't be much safer than staying at this house. He accepted and was shown the room. The house was adorned with antique everything. Not a piece of furniture seemed to have been purchased in the last 60 years. Mr. Palmer showed him to his room and bid him a good night. The man was nice but the whole situation left Jeff unnerved. He just tried to tell himself that he had watched far too many horror movies as a child. None of this could really be scary. The bedroom had a canopy bed, one old lamp, a single window, and a red carpet. The house was eerily quiet, except for a creak here and a small thump there. But now, Jeff's imagination had him too paranoid to sleep as he heard Mr. Palmer outside the room, walking up and down the hallway outside. Up he went, down he went. Then the footsteps stopped, right outside his room. Jeff waited, yet nothing happened. Half an hour passed, and yet he heard nothing except for the rain beating outside and the wind howling as the storm blew on. Finally, sleep slowly overcame Jeff, even with his nervousness at a heightened state. Slowly, his eyes closed, though he could almost hear something scratching at his door. Jeff awoke. The storm had passed and the daylight was shining through the window curtains. Happy that all his nervousness was for nothing, Jeff got out of bed and checked his watch. He had slept until 11.20 in the afternoon and had to leave quickly before people from the garage got to his car. Leaving the room, he was greeted by Mr. Palmer. Palmer asked him if he had slept well. Jeff replied that he had, though he had trouble falling asleep. Palmer laughed and asked if he was afraid of the old house at night in the middle of nowhere. Jeff admitted that maybe he was a bit afraid, but he felt silly for it now. He thanked Mr. Palmer and said that he had to leave quickly to get his car. He turned to leave, when suddenly something banged his head and everything went dark. When Jeff came to, he was tied to a chair in the basement. The place reeked of horrible smells. Mr. Palmer walked up to him with a large knife in his hand. Jeff screamed and tried to free himself, but only tired himself out. He looked up in horror at Mr. Palmer and asked him why he was doing this. Why now? Palmer answered that last night he would have been nervous, 
full of fear and ready for any attack Palmer would do. <laughs> no, that wasn't the right time. Everyone expects attack at night. But during the morning, <laughs> people were more relaxed and the fear was quite low, quite, quite low, making them blind to any chance of harm. Jeff begged him again why he was doing this, what he was going to do with him, and said that someone like the garage people would, would, would find out what happened. Mr. Palmer said that mishaps happen on the highways at night, mainly during storms, so hardly anybody would even think twice as to why he had gone. If anyone did actually start asking questions, Palmer said that he had ways to discourage that kind of activity. As for why he was doing this, Palmer simply said that Jeff need not worry about that. In fact, he need not worry about anything anymore. Jeff looked into Palmer's eyes as he walked toward him. His eyes were completely black, and Jeff tried to scream. I'm not sure when Abe first got obsessed with Halloween, but I knew about it before we even started dating. I actually met him for the first time at a costume party. I was dressed as an apple, <laughs> and by that I mean I wore a red dress and a green hat. I threw it together last minute, since my friend was the one dragging me to the party. Abe was dressed as a werewolf stuck between a wolf and a man. The amount of effort he put into his costume was remarkable. He even walked like a halfling and howled at incoming party guests. Something drew us together. Maybe it was our mutual hatred of candy corn, or the way we would both down five beers without blinking. Whatever it was, it led to a first date, and within seven months, we were engaged. The thing I loved most about Abe was his ambition. He was a business major with plans on starting his own company. He would design and produce Halloween-themed goods for haunted houses. He explained that more and more ordinary people were opening up their homes in the spirit of a good scare, and he wanted to support that by making unique and frightening products. Plus, he dreamed of having his own haunted house someday. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I adored his passion. We were married in May and pregnant by June. Abe decided to use his savings to buy us a nice little house right outside the city. The neighborhood was full of families and right next to an elementary school. Our neighbors were Paula and Jake, a wonderful young couple with two small children. We bonded with them right away. All seemed fine, except for one thing, Dirk. Dirk lived to the right of us, he was a white man in his mid-fifties who took one look at our biracial family and nearly had a conniption. When he saw us walking or working in the yard, he would give the Nazi salute and a belly laugh as if it were the funniest thing he'd ever done. It wasn't just us he tortured. No one in the neighborhood liked him. He would leave his poor dog outside in the rain all day, chained roughly to his porch. His wife was a small woman who endured a vast vocabulary of insults day and night. If a kid's ball flew into his yard, he made a point to pick it up and carry it inside. It was almost like he tried to do anything possible to make himself hated. But oddly, there was a one-day exception to his cruelty, and that was Halloween. Our first year in the neighborhood, we got to experience Dirk's haunted house. Abe had been longingly planning one of his own, but it was simply out of our budget this year. So when we found out our loudmouth racist neighbor had one, we were more than a little shocked. We were having coffee with Paula and Jake on a cold October day when we heard about the event. He does it every year, 
Jake said, juggling their two-year-old and nearly spilling a teapot. It's his thing. But do you go? Abe asked, confused. (laughs) Of course, Paula laughed. It's the one time of year when the man's demeanor actually changes and matches the occasion. Plus, it's genuinely scary in there. He must work on the props all year, and he never uses the same thing twice. Paula and I were nervous to go at first, Jake admitted. But literally everyone in the neighborhood shows up. People even let their kids in there, and you know I wouldn't let either of mine near his house. It's just like Halloween is his thing or something. He can be as evil as he wants to, and it just works. Abe and I were still a little scared, and not in a good way, of Dirk's haunted house. But we decided to go and at least judge for ourselves. We got to the door and Dirk's wife was standing outside handing out tickets. She took one look at my pregnant belly and shook her head. No, not for you, she said in a shaky, off-kilter tone. Why? Too scary. Not want to risk the baby. She handed Abe a ticket and shooed me away with her fingers. Don't worry, hon, I'll go in and tell you how it is, he said kindly. I'm sure it's terrible anyway. So I went home. I was more than a little disappointed, but being scared wasn't really my thing anyway. Abe came home around an hour later. He was frowning and looked awful. Babe, how was Dirk's house? His demeanor didn't change as he slumped down on the couch. In a sad, almost hurtful voice, he replied, It was incredible. Surprised, I urged him to tell me more. He had an entire room where blood poured out from the walls. Animatronic ghosts jumped out at you when you least expected it. There was an empty cradle with a trail of blood. It was a perfect mixture of disturbing and downright scary. The best part was the only time you actually had to interact with Dirk was when he was playing a torture victim. Watching him scream was rather satisfying. But it didn't make up for the fact that this jerk, this guy who is basically the epitome of all things evil, is better at Halloween than I am. Sweetie, I laughed, I know you love Halloween, but just because Dirk makes a good haunted house doesn't make him better than you. Next year I'm sure you'll knock it out of the park. He gave me a small smile, and I thought the matter was over. But it wasn't. Abe talked constantly about the perfection of Dirk's haunted house. He would make guesses at how things were put together. He spent his free time building prototypes to mimic Dirk's props, or even improve upon them. This went on for months. A huge animatronic witch had taken over our living room. Robotic spiders prowled the hallway. The only room he didn't touch was the nursery. But soon we had a little one to occupy our time. Ophelia, Fee for short, was born in March. She was absolutely perfect. She was born with a full head of curly black hair. Maybe I had a bias, but I honestly had never seen anything more beautiful than an infant. I loved her from the instant I held her in my arms. Abe was no different. We doted on our baby girl as much as possible. Abe was an excellent father. I loved watching the two of them interact. Abe was so gentle with her. His only flaw was his continued obsession with the haunted house. When he wasn't at work or playing with Fee, he was designing for the perfect Halloween house. When October came, Abe was feverish with excitement. The plan, make a haunted house like nothing anyone had ever seen. Not only would it be scary while you were inside, but the fear would last for nights afterwards. He wanted to really freak people out, cause nightmares, make his exhibit unforgettable. I believed he could do it. With his imagination and engineering background, anything was possible. He started to advertise his haunted house a week or so before Halloween. I think his goal was to get as many people there as possible. He left flyers in people's mailboxes, even under their windshield wipers. He even left one for Dirk. 
but that was a massive mistake. No sooner had he dropped the flyer off than Dirk was banging on our front door. Abe was still out flyering, but I greeted Dirk as politely as I could. Hello, Dirk, I said civilly. What the heck is this? He screamed through my screen door. In his hand was one of Abe's flyers. Keep your voice down. I turned around to check on Fee, who was gurgling sleepily in her swing. Before I knew what was happening, Dirk burst through the screen door and had his arm around my neck. Your husband thinks he can take over. In my neighborhood. My territory. His arm dug into my throat. Please, Dirk, you're hurting me. Tears fell down my cheeks. I was all alone. I knew Dirk was a bully, but I didn't know he could be this dangerous. I could do much worse to you. He pushed me onto the floor and stood over me. You tell your husband that if he goes through with the haunted house, I'll kill him. No, no, I'll kill you first. Then your little abomination over there. And I'll make him watch. He spat at my face. No one crosses me. With that, he slammed the front door and left me on the ground, sobbing. Fee had woken up and was crying as well. Shakily, I got to my feet and called Abe. He told me to call the police, but I was too scared. Dirk was a violent man. I just sat on the floor rocking Fee until Abe came home. He did everything to make me feel safer. He wrapped us up in blankets and made me hot chocolate. With hurt in his voice, he pleaded me to call the police. I don't want to make it worse, I said softly. But he's just a bully, a racist jerk. I looked him in the eye. You have to promise me you won't do a haunted house this year. Abe's mouth fell open. Come on, that means he wins. I don't care what it means. I don't want that man anywhere near us. Abe shook his head. This haunted house means the world to me. I glared at him. More than me? More than Fee? He didn't say anything. Instead, he kissed my forehead and stroked Fee's cheek. I could see in his face that he regretted what he said. It was so hurtful. But I knew it came from a place of pain, not cruelty. I put Fee in her crib and went to bed. Abe kissed me deeply. He stroked my hair and whispered that everything would be okay. I felt confident that it was all over. I wish I had been right. But in those blissful hours of sleep, I had forgotten the violent monster that was our neighbor. By the time we woke up, Abe made a self-care plan for me. He would buy me a few nights at a hotel over Halloween. That way, I would feel safer and free from Dirk. He said he would stay home and take care of Fee. Although I was nervous to leave, Abe convinced me that it would be the best for everyone. He would keep an eye on the house and make sure nothing sinister went on with Dirk. I begged Abe to come with me. He explained that having the baby around might cause extra anxiety for me. Plus, I deserved a few days to relax. Reluctantly, I left my family for Halloween weekend. I have to admit, it was a wonderful hotel. It had a full spa, swimming pool, salon, and even a five-star restaurant. My first day, I took advantage of everything. The massages and bubble baths did quite a bit to help ease my fear. I wrapped myself in a fluffy robe and ordered room service. It was pure luxury. I called Abe a little after five. He said everything was fine. Dirk hadn't bothered him at all. He even let me talk to little Fee, who was babbling into the phone. I giggled. I was so blessed. Abe told me to just take care of myself and come home tomorrow once Halloween was over. On Halloween morning, I awoke in a cushy bed, covered in delicate blankets, feeling incredible. My night had been full of dreams of Dirk moving away. I stayed in my bed leisurely until I got hungry. 
I wandered down to the restaurant and treated myself to the largest waffle I'd ever seen. Then I spent the afternoon getting my nails done. I felt great. Around four, I called Abe to check in, but he didn't answer. I figured maybe he was running an errand. I went back to my room and called again at 4.30. Still, no answer. My chest got tight. It wasn't like Abe not to answer the phone. I called again at 4.45. Still no answer. I started to panic. I called Paula and Jake. Paula answered. Hey, what's up? She sounded surprised to hear me. I was wondering if you might be willing to go over and check on Abe and Fee. He isn't answering the phone and, and I'm getting worried. She laughed. I just saw him. He's fine. I breathed a long sigh of relief. Thank God, Paula. I was just so scared. The only thing to be scared of is your house, Paula chuckled. Sounds like it's opening up soon. I paused. What are you talking about? Your house, Paula said, confused. Abe's been working on it all weekend. It looks amazingly creepy. Your guy is definitely going to beat Dirk this year. I began to hyperventilate. This couldn't be true. Paula, listen to me closely. Are you saying Abe is putting a haunted house up? Yes. Paula probably thought I was insane. Is everything okay? I tried to respond, but the phone fell from my hand. I could hear Paula talking on the other end, but I couldn't handle it. Abe had broken my trust. He had gone behind my back. He had endangered us. Who knew what Dirk could do to him? Chafi. Without a word, I gathered my things, hanging up on a concerned Paula. I left the hotel without checking out. I had to get home as soon as possible. The streets were full of people and costumes. There was a ton of traffic. I anxiously waited for the lights to churn green. A man on the street started screaming, and I nearly rear-ended the car in front of me. I was completely on edge. Too many people who looked dead. Too many monsters. I tried to go as fast as I could, but it took me over an hour to get home. When I arrived, I barely recognized the house. Abe had transformed the entire outside of it into a ramshackle hovel. He used broken boards to construct a facade covering the front. Out of one window hung a very realistic-looking body, which twitched when the wind hit it. There was a large sign by the door painted in red. Come in, but don't expect to come out. <laughs> I watched as some of our neighbors entered the house, giggling in fear. Abe was nowhere to be seen. Terrified, I parked the car and went inside. The first thing I heard was a baby crying. It didn't sound like Fee, but the noise unnerved me. I could hear screams from other people in the house. Abe had removed all our things and replaced every single room with disturbing imagery. The front hall was padded in something that looked like breathing flesh. The living room was the scene of a suicide. A man lay on the floor, surrounded by paper. The paper was littered in the scribbles of a madman. On the walls were more ramblings, but these included the names of people in the neighborhood. I checked to see if the man on the floor was Abe, but thank God he wasn't. I had no idea who it was, but it definitely wasn't a mannequin. The dining room was covered in creepy dolls. Some of them moved unexpectedly. One even reached out, and I swear it grabbed my hair. I don't know how Abe made them, but they were so disturbing. One of the dolls kept taking off her dress and putting it back on. She had deep red between her legs. I ran into the next room, which was the kitchen. It was a butcher shop. Slabs of meat were tossed across the floor. Everything was rotting. Flies and rats feasted on the remains. The fridge was shaking as though someone were inside. I screamed, Abe! Abe, come out right now! But no one responded. 
a group of young girls rushed by me, shrieking with frightful delight. I bit my lip and climbed the stairs toward the bedroom. I was done. Abe had gone too far. He had ruined our house. I finally got upstairs and heard someone throwing up in the bedroom. I walked in and saw the bedroom was basically untouched. I stepped cautiously, knowing that any minute something scary might pop up. The large witch Abe had created was sitting on the bed, but she wasn't plugged in. That's when I noticed Jake throwing up on the floor. I approached him slowly. Jake, are you... When he saw me, he jumped up and grabbed my shoulders. His eyes were crazy. <laughs> get out, he yelled. G get, out, get outside now. I shook him off. So you're part of this crap storm too? I realized he was crying. No, J just please go outside. Paula called the police. I don't know what happened. We can't find Abe. A dead cold spread through my body. What happened? I demanded. Please, go outside and wait for the police. That's when I heard the group of girls start to scream. They were in the room across from the bedroom, the nursery. Any control I had left was gone. I ran from Jake into the next room. Fee's crib was in the middle of the floor. The scene was pure white except for the mobile that hung above her head. Instead of planes that usually hung there, there was a noose. Attached to the noose was the dead body of a baby slowly twirling. I clutched my chest. It couldn't be. It had to be fake. The corpse spun just a little further and I saw the face. Her face. My beautiful Ophelia, hanging like a bloated maggot from the rope. Her skin was parchment white. There was no blood on her, just vomit and deep marks where she was bound. I fell backward. Something deeply human inside of me howled. Jake was suddenly beside me, trying to help, but I threw him back. Dirk had gotten his revenge. Tears welled up, but I refused to let them fall. I stormed out of the house. I knew Dirk had Abe as well. I would stop whatever sick, twisted thing he was doing to my husband. Jake kept calling for me to stop, but I only had eyes to the house next door. I had no fear. I ran past his tiny wife who looked terrified at me. I didn't flinch at the jump scares or gross decor inside his house. I would find him. Dirk, I whistled menacingly. I'm coming for you. I don't know what the inside looked like. I didn't care. I had one mission, to find the monster who did that to my daughter. It only took me a few minutes to find Dirk on the lawn, prowling in an insect costume. When he saw me, his eyes fired with rage. You... He hissed. I told you not to let your... Husband! I finished for him, grabbing the shovel next to his house. Not to let my black husband make a haunted house. You're such a pathetic sack of crap that you care more about this one thing than about my child's life. His rage subsided into confusion. I... No, you don't get to talk. I don't know where I got the strength, but I lifted the shovel and clocked him in the jaw. He fell to the ground with a satisfying bang. You are a monster, you know that? I kicked him in the stomach. After I find out what you did to my husband, I'll kill you. He moaned in pain. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. No? I slammed him again and again in the stomach. You truly are an insect. I hovered the heel of my shoe over his left eye and pressed down. His eyeball popped like a grape. He was now screaming. Pain is too good for you. I'll make you wish you had never spoken a word to my family. 
Jake ran onto the scene. He was flanked by Paula and two police officers who had their guns drawn. Paula took Jake's hand in fear. Jake started talking in a soft tone. Honey, you need to come with us. I turned to them, finally letting the tears out of my eyes. You saw what he did to my baby. Jake was crying too. No, you don't understand. I understand that he strangled Fee until her little heart stopped beating. My hands were in fists. Jake turned to Paula, who took over. Honey, Dirk didn't kill her. My body was shaking so much, I nearly fainted. He, he did. He killed her, and he probably killed Abe too. I just can't find him yet. He threatened me last week. He told me he would do this. I don't know anything about last week, but we know he didn't hurt Ophelia. Paula moved towards me, lifting a gentle hand. Abe turned himself in twenty minutes ago. What? The world suddenly stood still. I couldn't hear anyone crying or screaming. It was just quiet. The words hung in the air, inaudible. I could almost see them, touch them. Abe. When I came back to reality, I had been handcuffed by one of the officers. Paula was trying to speak to me as they led me away. I couldn't understand. Nothing made sense. Paula began to yell. Please, don't take her to the station. Let her stay with us. She's grieving. She doesn't know. But they took me to the station anyway. I was arrested for disorderly conduct. After taking my statement, they decided to let me back to Paula and Jake's. They held me as I cried. They held my hands as I screamed. And finally, after hours and hours, they tucked me into bed to let me sleep. If it weren't for them, I might have ended my life that night. I'm still staying with them now as their full-time nanny. We've kind of created a new little family for ourselves. And we don't celebrate Halloween. In some rare speck of humanity, Dirk didn't press charges against me. I think he almost respected me for what I had done. He wears an eye patch now and never speaks to me. But when he sees me, he lifts his chin in admiration. The violence I enacted made me more like him. I don't like to think about it. I saw Abe twice after that, once at his trial where he was sentenced to thirty-five years in prison for the murder of our daughter. When the judge asked him about that night, he spent hours in joyful description of building the house and setting up the scenes. He exclaimed that he had officially won. His was the best haunted house anyone had ever seen, and Ophelia had been the linchpin to secure his victory. A month before the trial, I requested a meeting with him. His lawyers strongly objected to it, but he made the final choice. I went to the prison where he was being held. He sat behind a thick wall of glass. He looked terrible. I wasn't sad about it. I lifted the receiver and pressed it to my ear. He did the same. We sat in silence for many minutes. Then, finally, in as strong a voice as I could muster, I asked, Why? He looked away from me. Isn't it obvious? When his eyes slid back into place, there was something crazy in them. His forlorn look morphed into a sinister smile. I held my breath. All he said was, <laughs> I loved Halloween more than I loved you.